Good evening, everyone. On behalf of the Internal Quality Assurance Cell, Profullo Chandra College, Kolkata, I, Unuradha Majumdar, Assistant Professor of English, extend a hearty and warm welcome to you all, uh, those who have joined us for this international webinar titled COVID-19 Pandemic, Incidents and Containment. Uh, right at the start, we would like to uh, express uh, our, uh, I mean, you know, apology for the fact that we started a bit late, late today because of facing network issues. So I hope uh, you all understood, and I also dropped in a message on behalf of the college. So a warm welcome, everyone, once again. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has indeed been uh, the biggest civilizational crisis that we've been facing uh, since the beginning of this year. Uh, and it has severely challenged our notions of human progress. It has uh, raised issues, it has raised serious questions about uh, the, uh, the so-called superiority of the human race over the other species on the planet. And it has definitely raised to dust our pride in our intellectual achievements uh, in its stubborn refusal to be contained or uh, curbed, uh, killing millions of people across the world and affecting uh, even millions more. And uh, interestingly and curiously, however, uh, history bears witness to the fact that adversities of all kinds have more often than not acted as stimuli, acted as catalysts uh, to human beings in their quest for more and more knowledge. And humans have always sought more knowledge uh, regarding the problems at hand, partly in order to uh, ward off anxiety and partly in order to solve the crisis at hand. And it is in this spirit that the internal quality assurance cell of our college has organized this webinar, international webinar today, in which two eminent speakers, experts in their own fields, will talk about uh, the uh, salient features of the COVID-19 pandemic, will deliberate on its multidimensional impact on our lives, and also discuss the best means of containing the pandemic and restricting its effect, its impact on our lives. So in this sense, uh, I think the webinar is an, an attempt on our part to make the best of a bad situation. With these words, uh, we would like to uh, move on to the formal inaugural session of this webinar. And uh, for this purpose, I would like to request our respected principal, uh, Dr. Ratna Korpani, to say a few words on this occasion. So uh, Dr. Pani, over to you, sir. Thank you, Anuradha. Good evening to all of you. I extend a warm welcome to all the participants of this webinar. I also heartily welcome the speakers, Dr. Sujoy Ghosh of Calcutta University and Professor Dr. Oscar Franco of University of Born Switzerland. I congratulate the IQAC coordinator and her entire team for organizing this webinar on a very relevant and important issue. We have been struggling globally with COVID-19. Since a number of months, we are coming across through this pandemic. Though the incidence seems to differ across countries with disparities in its recovery rate and death rates, the bottom line is that we all are going through a very precarious situation. We'll, if we just take the Indian example, 
in particular a closed loop might remind us of the danger that is coming large at us i would like to share some data just to visualize the situation where we are standing right now dr salam if you kindly share my screen is it visible no sir not yet not, not yet visible. sir please share the screen sir please share your screen uh, below the option is there share is it visible now no sir not yet we can't see you go to the option share screen below below at bottom share screen option is there click on that i have given given it ha uh, and uh, there, there another screen arakta screen as be dekho there is uh, share window is there please select the window okay and then click share is it visible now yes sir yes please select sir okay is it visible now yes yes yes, okay. yes sir now in the left hand side uh, till 10 am today the corona cases in the world is 14.6 million and in india 1.1 million death has been registered till today 10 am at the world level it is 6 108000 in india 27000 at the same time recovery rate is uh, recovered total number of cases recovered at the global level is 8 million more than 8 millions and in case of india 700000 now let us look at the indian cases how started from 2nd of february uh, now it is reaching about 1.1 million how the path goes please follow this path since uh, june 2020 uh, its growth rate is very high you can see right now now if we just look at the daily new cases now it is about more than 40000 it is more than 40000 right now daily cases registered in india now if we look at the death uh, registered in india and the path how it grows uh, again we see from june it has gone up uh, right now it is 27500 now if we look at the peak day it reached the peak 2006 on 16th june right now it is about more than 650 every day now if we compare the new cases with the recovery rate we will find there is a gap about 18000 every day now total confirmed cases in different states of india if you look at the 
scenario, you will find Maharashtra is at the top, followed by Tamil Nadu and Delhi, and the cases are much higher. In Maharashtra itself, it's 3 million, 3 lakhs, sorry, 3 lakhs right now. Now, if we look at the state's cure rate, the percentage is high at Ladakh and very low at Meghalaya, where India's recovery rate is about two-third of the uh, total registered cases. Now, if we look at the death rate, uh, we will find Gujarat is now at the top and nearly 4.5% and uh, lowest in uh, four or five states and our Nicobar to Sikkim. And India's death rate is about nearly 2.5%. Now, in spite of this, the government of India is saying that we are in a better position compared to other states. If you look at the uh, pictures, the where from this data comes, they are just going for a statistical analysis and saying that we are better off the other states. Uh, if you look at the uh, death per million population, our rate is only 20, whereas US rate is 433, and uh, Spain's rate is uh, 608. But this type of statistics cannot do anything. If we look this type of statistics and project uh, what is the case right now, if all the case uh, population of India is tested, till today, then it would, would have been uh, about 11 compared to uh, USA, 2 crore 67 lakhs. So we are not better off in this statistical analysis. The government of India should look into the real situation and take necessary steps. These are only two just to remind most of us uh, have already gone through all these things. Now, historically, this type of pandemic is not a new one or not unheard one. The world has been affected with pandemic of several the world has been uh, afflicted with pandemics times and again, only their forms and natures are different. But the most important thing is all the pandemic crises have been successfully overcome. So we are also extremely hopeful that with different precautions, strategies, different governmental policies with improvement in our infrastructure, we might be able to contain this COVID-19. And once the vaccine uh, is formulated, we can eradicate the disease. I am not a specialist of this area, so I just leave uh, the discussion to our uh, distinguished speakers. Today, we have two distinguished speakers of uh, their respective fields, and this discussion is going to be on medical and biological ground. And I think this will help us about the uh, spreading of COVID-19 and containment thereof. I think all of you will enjoy this webinar and I thank all of you for joining with us. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Pani. Uh, that was a very illuminating uh, talk indeed. And we also share in your hope 
that we find a cure to this problem very soon in the interest of the larger human race. Um, uh, and uh, after this, I would welcome the IQAC coordinator of our college, Dr. Shonali Roy, to speak a few words on this occasion. So, uh, Dr. Roy, over to you, please. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Radha. Am I audible? Yes, you are. Ah. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this international webinar on COVID-19 pandemic incidents and containment brought to you by IQAC Prabhupada Chandra College. I'd like to extend my hearty welcome to all. Over the period of four months, we have been receiving a multitude of news as well as opinions from all across the globe. In India, we all have been experiencing a paradigm shift in the way we live our lives, but an end to it does not seem anywhere in sight. In the beginning of this year, 2020, little did we know that it would bring such incredible change to our li all our lives directly or otherwise. We have all been affected by this pandemic and even more so by the news panic and misinformation that came in its wave. By the end of this webinar, we hope to leave you with a better understanding of the incidents and most importantly, advice we can follow to contain the further spreading of this virus. We are fortunate to have with us today two eminent speakers in the field of zoology and the epidemiology and public health. It's our privilege to hear from them today. I'd like to welcome our distinguished speakers, Dr. Shujai Ghosh and Dr. Oscar Franco, Professor of Epidemiology and Public Health and Professor Ghosh in Calcutta University, the Department of Zoology. We are here to learn from them how best we can deal with this pandemic. I would also welcome the president and the members of the governing body, both internal and external members of IQSC, my colleagues and students. I'd like to welcome all participants. Their encouraging response to this webinar made us confident. On behalf of IQSC, I'd like to mention the convener, Dr. Ongshuman Mukherjee, Joint convener Professor Shorna Ganguly and Professor Onuradha Mojumdar have taken all responsibilities and burden to make it a success. I convey my gratitude and best wishes to them. Now, let us move to the technical stations. I can promise that you will find your time well spent by the end of this webinar. Thank you all. Thank you, Shanalidi, for your good wishes. Uh, wishing this, uh, you know, for this um, for this webinar. And uh, before we move into the technical session, I would also like uh, our con convener, Dr. Ongshuman Mukhopadhyay, to say a few words on this occasion. So, Ongshuman, over to you. Uh, very good evening, uh, I'm Professor Dr. Ongshuman Mukhopadhyay. Now, all of us are wishing uh, you good evening. Uh, but you may ask, what is so good about this evening when we are actually all reeling under this, uh, you know, burden of this uh, pandemic, COVID-19. Now, I don't really want to prolong this inaugural uh, session because uh, whatever I'm going to say, it's going to be a kind of a reiteration after all. But it's a fact that this COVID-19 pandemic has uh, caught us unawares, even when 
uh, there were many forecasts, perhaps, which were made warning us against imminent microbes related pandemic situations because of global warming, as well as uh, you know, several cultural practices adopted by us, uh, by people in general, like food habits and others, which we may question but cannot really address very promptly and very wisely always. And some of these issues or these problems have to, uh, to be dealt with for a very long period of time and they demand constant uh, and scientific proving and analysis. And some of them are to be dealt on a completely different level altogether. Now that the disease is becoming difficult to contain, it seems, now this has to be addressed on a war footing. And no one of us can say that we are uh, sort of immune to this. We don't really need to know about what is happening. And there are certain queries, certain questions which are rising in my mind as well. Perhaps the answers to them I'm going to get from this particular international webinar from the two uh, speakers, the eminent speakers that we have uh, today with us. The questions like, why this particular, uh, you know, um, virus has, uh, you know, affected different countries in different degrees? And what is the issue of this comorbidity? And what are the long-standing psychological impact of uh, such a pandemic, like the pandemics, pandemic or a pandemic-like situation, or and, and at most or, or above all, whether there is any particular vaccine site or not, we are all waiting for because we have been, you know, uh, um, you know, hearing a lot of news regarding uh, the vaccines which are about to come, which are in the often. So it's kind of, uh, you know, a wait that never seems to come to an end right at this point in time. We are going to listen to the speakers who are going to enlighten us on these issues. And that's it. I wish this entire uh, program uh, success and just be with us and, and listen to the speakers. Thank you. And Onurada, kindly introduce our uh, you know, first speaker today. Yes. Uh, thank you, Omshuman. Uh, so we move on to the technical session uh, today. And it is uh, my privilege to welcome our first distinguished speaker, Dr. Shujoy Ghosh. And let me just quickly read a short bio note of Dr. Ghosh to introduce him properly to you. Dr. Shujai Ghosh is Associate Professor in the Department of Zoology, University of Calcutta. After completing his PhD from the West Bengal University of Technology, Dr. Ghosh carried out his postdoctoral studies in the University of Pittsburgh. His primary research interests include Drosophila genetics and human genetics, particularly the genetics of birth defect and mental retardation. He has served as syndicate nominee to various colleges affiliated to the University of Calcutta, and also as member of the Undergraduate Board of Studies in Zoology, Calcutta University. A life member of Indian Science Congress Association and the executive member of the Zoological Society of India. Dr. Ghosh is also a member of the International Trisomy 21 Research Society based in Paris. Dr. Ghosh has research collaborations with Pittsburgh University and Emory University, the United States of America. He has also contributed several chapters and articles to prestigious national and international books and journals. Uh, so I extend my hearty welcome to Dr. Shujai Ghosh today. And over to you, sir. Uh, could you kindly begin your lecture? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rapnasar Pani and Professor Onuradha Mohindar and other eminent members of the governing body of Prokhulikandra College and faculty members as well as participants. This is my privilege that uh, I got a chance to share my thoughts and my little bit of work with uh, all of you. Though I am not a uh, virologist as well as epidemiologist, chiefly I am a human geneticist, but under this pandemic situation, I have taken uh, some of the work uh, on particular uh, bioactive molecules, which could provide us a little bit of uh, protection against the 
COVID-19 virus. And uh, surprisingly, uh, we got some very interesting result. Uh, some of these results will be presented in due course of my uh, presentations, number one. And secondly, my entire lecture is arranged in such a way that I will talk little amount of uh, origin of this uh, disease across the world. And next, I will talk about the prevention methods and detections a little bit. And lastly, if possible, I will enlight, try to enlighten some points uh, by which we can, we, we the teachers community in higher education sector, we can this, uh, handle these situations in the perspective of higher education, continuation of higher education. So title of my presentation is COVID-19 prevention control in higher education institution. So we are familiar with this uh, virus and these viruses now in day-to-day uh, -day talk and conversations in our life. And I'm directly going to the background of the uh, origin of this disorder or disease by the virus. It is actually in December 2019, a cluster of pneumonia cases was reported initially in one province of China, as you know, and this virus was found out as a coronavirus, a particular strain of coronavirus, and which in uh, 12 January 2020 by World Health Organization officially named this disease as coronavirus 2019 and COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2. This is a particular strain of virus that caused this disease across the world. In February 2020, Chinese scientists rapidly isolated the SARS-CoV virus genome and they published a blueprint. What is the genetic architecture of this virus, which is very much essential to design a specific drug against the virus. SARS-CoV virus or SARS-CoV-2 is actually a beta type of coronavirus which is in, 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 involved, enveloped in the non-segmented positive sense RNA virus. Its genetic content is uh, RNA made instead of DNA. These are some of the technical uh, jargons. I am just uh, avoiding these jargons to make it more lucid and simple. There are some other related strain of, strain of coronavirus which are found in different parts of the world but their virulence may vary. That is their infective nature may vary according to their architecture of the genome. The SARS coronavirus that is COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2 is 96, more than 96% identical with the COVID-RAD GT13, whereas it shares 79.5% identity with SARS -CoV other SARS cov virus. And based upon the virus genome architecture and sequencing result, we may presume, we may anticipate that probably bat is the animal which act as an agent to spreading of this virus at its initial phase. So there are some other pandemic incidents in the world, as you know, that atypical pneumonia or SARS was first reported from some province of the China in late 202 and that caused a global pandemic in 2003 approximately 10 percent of the case of fatality rate that fatality rate was negligible in terms of uh, its infectivity in compared to present condition then there is another type of infections was reported from the Saudi Arabia in 2012 which is actually caused by Mars COVID. And these, all these viruses, the SARS and Mars COVID viruses, actually the relative of present SARS COVID-19 virus. So come to the organization, molecular organization of this virus, which is very essential uh, for designing a specific drug against the virus. And there are four different categories of proteins which are present in the viral architecture. The first one is nucleocapsid protein. This nucleocapsid protein is actually these proteins, this green part actually incites this uh, pale green part. This is known as nucleocapsid protein. It actually bound the RNA genome to make the nucleocapsids. And this thread-like structure is its genome, 
which is the target for the all drug that we are designing. And there are some spikes proteins, as you actually observing here, this dark color spike protein. These spike protein are very important in terms of the detection of this virus in the human body. These spikes proteins are critical for binding with the host cell receptor. When the virus get ligated with our respiratory tract, respiratory tract cell, these spikes protein helps the virus to get adhered with the respiratory tract cell and then enter into the respiratory tract interior. And there is another protein known as envelope protein, this green one, this membrane-like protein, which actually make a boundary surrounding the capsid, nucleocapsid protein. And this envelope protein remain uh, intact throughout the life of this virus, and it forms a viral envelope. It is to some extent protective in nature. It provides protection uh, to the virus and uh, save the virus from the human immune system. And the membrane protein, that is the central organization of the COVID assembly, it determines the shape of viral envelope. So there are four different proteins, and all these different proteins are now being tested by the scientific authority to look which type of protein can be used as a target for detection purpose, as well as for uh, preventive purpose and designing of the drug. Now come to the cartoon, how does the virus establish in the human body? That is important thing to understand. Look, this virus that is SARS-CoV-2 and actually following their entry, get adhered to the respiratory tra tract mucous membrane. This respiratory tract mucous membrane has some receptor that is known as ACE2 receptor. This ACE2 receptors is actually responsible for important signaling in our body. But unfortunately, this receptor is complementary with these spike proteins. And these spikes protein, as you can see that, these spikes protein get bind with this receptor in lock and key fashion. And these binding facilitate their entry within the respiratory tract cell. Following their entry into the cell, they inject their genetic material within the cell and following this complicated process of genetic regulation, they ultimately lead to the productions of new proteins within the human respiratory tract cell. Following the production of these uh, proteins, this protein get assembled within the human cells and from there they generate a huge number of new viral particle and new viral particle then comes out from these infected cells and they have the potency to infect more and more fresh and healthy cells within our body. This is the basis of infection of this virus within the human body. Now come to this diagram. So this virus actually present in the wild animal. It may be rat, it may be bat, or maybe some other mammalian species. But unfortunately, if we take the flesh of these animals as our food in uncooked condition or not properly cooked condition, then these virus get entry in the human body. And from one human to another human, it could be spreaded in very contagious way. That is actually happening today. So there are certain host factors. Host factor means the factor or variables within the human body that determine the intensity of the disease. Because we can see nowadays that some people getting infection, but they don't have any manifestation of disease. So they are not suffering from the severity of the disease. But some people, they get infected easily and ultimately they could not survive. That variation in disease manifestation is actually determined by certain host factor, the factor which are present within our body. What are these? These are some susceptibility factor like hypertension. You know that if you have the high, high blood pressure or blood pressure related problem within your body, that may lead to the susceptibility of getting infection. Then chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Any kind of pulmonary disease or disorder can make you more susceptible for this disease. 
any kind of cardiovascular disease equally threat important and severe complication may arise if you have respiratory distress syndrome if you have some septic shock if you have some metabolic acidosis if you have some coagulation dysfunction coagulation dysfunction means problem in blood clotting if you have some problem in the blood clotting or delay in blood clotting that could uh, recognized as coagulation dysfunctions and multiple multiple organ failure and there are some other factors epidemiological factors perhaps my next speaker will enlighten you with these details but i just want to mention this elderly people that is the age more than 65 that is a very risk high risk factor for getting infections and people with underlying diseases which we actually recognize as comorbidity if you have some other disease infective disease in your body you could get the viral infections more easily so these are some of the host factor now come to the clinical characteristics that we are familiar from the media and newsprint but i just want to highlight a little as an emerging acute respiratory infectious disease covid-19 primarily spread through the respiratory tract by droplets respiratory secretions and direct contact and the receptor protein as you know that as i have uh, exhibited you in the in the cartoon that receptor proteins present in abundance in the lung alveolar epithelial cells and that make this lung alveolar epithelial cells more susceptible to receive these viral particle that is very unfortunate because this receptor protein is equally important for our physiological functioning normal physiological functioning but unfortunately that virus spike proteins are complementary with this receptor protein and that's why this receptor protein make our body more susceptible for this viral infection there are several symptoms as you know that these includes fever dry cough mild breathing problem gastrointestinal issues because lot of patients are coming every day with a report that they have diarrhea that diarrhea if you have such kind of diarrhea don't neglect because this diarrhea may be the manifestation of symptoms of covid infections maybe you may not have fever may not have cough may not have breathing problem trouble but if you have the gastrointestinal issues that is diarrhea or other issues loose motion that is indicative of you may have covid infections and different types of coughing and sneezing may be a causative factor for the transmissions and other common features are high fever pneumonia and kidney failure so this is a statistics what is the percentage of manifestations that is most of people having infections exhibit fever and then cough then fatigue then sputum productions then shortness of breath and sore throats headache gastrointestinal symptoms and the least percentage of the people they may exhibit also vomiting there are some blood parameters which are indicative of virus infections the number one is neutrophil count blood urea and creatinine levels become higher significantly following infection additionally there are certain inflammatory factors which are familiar to the students or teachers of biological science may not be familiar with the other discipline but these are called interleukins and interferons these are some of the immunological messengers these messengers actually indicates their additional elevated level indicates that you may have infections and icu patients usually have higher plasma level of interleukin 2 interleukin 7 and interleukin 10 these are some important serological factors through which we can predict that a patient may have covid infection and this is the beautiful photographs of the condition of the covid infected lung you can see that there are huge congestions this is the secretion of the mucus and development of certain cellular projections to prohibit the viral infections and that led to the heavy lung congestion lung usually loses its elasticity there is breathing problems and patient have to enter into the 
ventilation, ventilating support for their survival. So this is a photograph of the lung. Now come to the epidemiology. I think my next speaker will uh, elaborate these epidemi epidemiological features. I just mentioned that, that there is one to 14 days. As you know that 14 days is a incubation period. That is after entering the virus may not manifest its infective nature or you may not have fever, fever, but within 14 days, you may develop some of these uh, uh, mentioned uh, symptoms that is indicative of your infective nature and highly transmissible especially among the elderly peoples and peoples with underlying other diseases so i am not going detail into it because your principal ratna korpani have already seen some statistics here it uh, also representing how the number is going high it is the estimate at the early june now the figure has been changed up to july and death per lack of population there is huge death and principally all this death occurred due to the uh, deficiency of the oxygen in the blood so there is a problem of oxygen deliberations so any patient if they have some symptoms of covid infection immediately we may support them providing a little bit of oxygen therapy that is recommended so that oxygen therapy may reduce the rate of fatality. That is important too. What actually happening today, the crisis is developing over the issues that the family member could not understand the situations and they are traveling from one hospital to other hospital and then from other. So, but the simple thing is that if we arrange a oxygen cylinder and mask for the patient for the time being, that patient could survive without taking help from the hospital too. That is important. So oxygen therapy is very effective therapeutic agent for the COVID treatment. Diagnostic criteria, how could we confirm that, yes, this infection is COVID? So we have two tests. One is genetic test. That is that RNA, presence of that RNA that I have shown in this cartoon, the structure of the COVID virus and how this COVID virus have their RNA sequence. That RNA is very unique for the COVID and RT-PCR test is a gold standard test for confirming the presence of RNA within our system. And secondly, obviously, presence of antibody because following entry into the body, COVID virus may elicit antibody response within our system and our immune system will produce a huge amount of antibody against COVID and presence of that COVID specific antibody confirms that yes, the patient have COVID infection. So we have two diagnostic criteria. First one is real time PCR by which we can detect the RNA sequence of the COVID virus. And second one is the antibody which are being produced by our own immune system against the uh, COVID protein. And that immune system uh, antibody may be a very good diagnostic criteria for the COVID positivity. And here is the cartoon by which you can uh, understand briefly how this RNA testing is being done following this uh, covid entry we can actually taking the blood samples of the patients here it is in the right panel blood samples or nasal swab samples and then we isolate the rna we put them into the machine and using specific primer we can detect the presence of rna within the system or alternatively we can detect this antibody which is present in the blood due to the entry of covid virus so these are two common methods by which we can conforming our test so there are some criteria by who and us government the what would be the priority for the testing so we can skip these slides because this is not at all important for you and there are certain treatment as you know that there is no specific drug have been designed for the COVID treatment, we have to look for certain already approved and already used drug which are being in use for treatment of the other viral infections. So chloroquine, 
remdesivir dafamostat rivavirin these are common drug and the common name of the drug which are being used for the uh, treatment of other viral infections now they are emerging as an effective though they have some side effect but they could save the life of people having infections of covid 19 so regarding this uh, uh, common jargon that we are actually uh, observing in our daily newspaper and other media that we are gradually going to develop certain vaccines we are eagerly waiting for vaccines that is true across the world all peoples are waiting for the vaccines but that vaccine production is not a uh, one day technique is a long run technique and its long time is needed to come to the vaccine to the market so there are three different phases of treatment first phase this is repurposing drug repurposing drug means the drug that are already in use for treatment in other virus uh, infections can be used for the covid secondly the antibodies antibodies treatment that is the plasma therapy this is popular term nowadays you know that terminology from the newspaper this plasma therapy is nothing but to taking a little bit of plasma from the individual who have recovered from the covid infections because they are plasma and blood carrying the ready made antibody against the covid and the third one is vaccine for which we are waiting eagerly and maybe it maybe the september 2021 when we will be able to have our vaccine against covid so up to that time we have to take care of ourselves we have to careful for not getting our infections so these are the three phases of the treatment and this is the brief of the plasma therapy this how it is work this is a covid patient now covid patient have been recovered from the conditions and infections after a certain time of buffering period now the doctor can take out a little bit of plasma from his body and after this you can apply this plasma directly to the other patient infected with covid 19 and due to the presence of ready made antibody in the plasma that plasma immediately elicit a strong effect against the covid and this second patient could recover early this is actually the principle of plasma therapy now this is the time scale how the drug designing and antibody designing and vaccine design go through the different phases so first phase is conceptualizations and second phase is biosafety approval third is review committee passing that is actually done by the government of india uh, and its different wings biotechnology wings and everything fourth phase is genetic engineering approval committee so different committee and regulatory body actually are there who usually give green signal for the any proposal of developing drug and vaccine that's why the time is very lengthy and lastly the drug controller general of india he will provide the final approval and then examines the animal toxicity first we have to apply all the drugs and all the vaccines on the animal model first then from the animal model we have to take out the approval of the protocol then approval for the clinical trial then approval for the human applications we are now at the stage of this two that is approval of the human applications we are waiting for that prevention and control of the covid 19 all of you are familiar with this how we can control ourselves at least till the date of discovery of the vaccines now come to some latest development in which i have a little bit of role does indian plan show light of hope that is important the question came in our mind from the early days of covid infections how we could resist uh, ourselves from getting infected and is there any ayurvedic or medicinal plant of india that could provide safety so we started working with 15 different medicinal plant of indigenous origin 
the plants which are very familiar to us and the plants which are known for years of years for their uh, properties of uh, healing and their properties of uh, going against any viral or bacterial infections out of all tested uh, 15 plants we got remarkable results from the two important and very common plant material from our domestic use one is from tulsi that is the very holy plants probably all of we have these plants in our uh, home atmosphere and tulsi leaf actually carry the arsolic acid we have isolated the arsolic acid and another two are nimbaflavone and hyperocytes this nimbaflavone and hyperocytes are collected from the neem so tulsi and neem both these two plants are known for their common ayurvedic and medicinal quality over the decades and over the years over the civilizations and we have just isolated three compounds arsolic acid and hyperocytes in nimbaflavone from these plants these are the tulsi and these are the this is tulsi and this is neem neem has scientific name aja directa indica and osimum tenuiflorum is tulsi so what we did we isolated these three compounds this is from tulsi and these two from neem this is their chemical structure so what we did we tested them against the covid protein and this is called molecular docking this part this red circle part this one this one this one these are the covid molecule and this is our active agent that is hyperocyte from the neem you can see that this hyperocyte after entering into the covid protein now blocking the different protein molecule at the covid surface so these are the chemical bond that they are making with this these molecules of hyperocytes are making with the covid protein molecule and preventing the covid protein from normal functioning in similar way we have tested the nimboflavone another important compound isolated from the neem and it also exhibit a strong binding this red color area is actually the covid protein and this green and white structure is the nimbaflavone and you can see it in this diagram in this cartoon this nimbaflavone strongly affecting the different amino acid molecule of the covid protein so that it can block this covid protein altogether and third one is tulsi is another important that is arsolic acid it has very complicated architecture and several point at several point arsolic acid showing the inhibitory effect onto the covid protein so these three are most promising there are rest 12 i am not exhibiting all those results right now because of constraints uh, in the timing and stringency of the timing but these results are very promising that suggests that we have we indian have certain uh, plants in our hand by which we can produce the drug and these drugs probably have little amount of the side effect due to their natural origin and that could be applied effectively to increase the resistance and to prevent the virus altogether now come to the next part my lecture i just go brief on to this that is COVID-19 and its impact of higher education with the people who are joined with the higher education system and linked with the higher education systems we are facing those problems you are familiar with that that is complete closure of the institution courses remain incomplete uncertainty of the completion of the curriculum for the final semester and the final year student uncertainty of the placement because a lot of technical students they are waiting for their job but unfortunately they couldn't because as they don't have their final year results discontinue the research work we are facing this problem we the people could not come to the lab and our different cultures and different study get interrupted just due to this lockdown obviously psychological impact on faculty and students all we get depressed due to this long term uh, lockdown situation and all the infrastructural development of the institution get halted there are certain 
uh, statistical value, how the global coronavirus impact actually causes the deleterious effect on higher education system and higher education related individuals. So the pandemic has significantly disturbed the higher education sector as well, which is critical determinant of the country's economic future. That is important. A large number of the Indian students, second to only China, enroll in the universities abroad, particularly US, UK, Australia, but they are not in position to go and join their respective universities. So there is both way loss. On the one side, our students not in position to grab their higher education opportunity in those uh, countries. And uh, on the other side, these US, UK, Australia, and China, these institutions are actually suffering from having no student from other countries. That is a very, uh, very uh, depressing situation. Many such students have now been brought from the leaving those countries, as you know, that already U.S. education system and U.S. government have imposed uh, prohibitions on the Chinese student to move into the U.S. So this is the conditions across the world. The bigger concern, however, the everybody's mind is effect of the disease on the employment rate. There is gradual decrease in the employment every day. A lot of people are losing their day-to-day -day activities and job. So every nation is suffering from the lack of job. That is the big challenges in this condition. The pandemic has transformed the centuries-old chalk and talk system of teaching. So that's why we are adopting different types of online teaching system. This disruption in the delivery education is pursuing policymaker to figure out how to drive engagement at scale while ensuring inclusive e-learning solution. So we have entered into the e-learning system and we have to adopt that. Fortunately or unfortunately, I don't know because some of the teachers are very much familiar with the e-learning processes and computer-based teaching processes, but some teachers are not at all familiar. So they have to take these options under constraint. So we need certain platform and our India government already made some Diksha platform for this kind of, though there was no pandemic when Diksha was introduced, but now Diksha is one of the major opportunity for the teachers as well as students to go through this web-based and computer-based e-learning system. So many inclusive learning solutions can be introduced to the Diksha and many aspirational districts have initiated innovative mobile-based learning module for effective delivery of the system. That is the development of the higher education system in the last four months of the lockdown situation across the world. So we have to think of that. But unfortunately, what happened, there are some positive side and there are some negative side. I am directly coming to this point. What are the positive and negative side of this e-learning system? Come to this point. I'm just keeping some of the slides which may not be interesting to you. So e-learning is actually the computer-based learning have some positive and negative impact of itself. Positive impact are some time-saving system, definitely. It's a flexible system. It is an energy-efficient system, higher comprehensive and affordable. The cost is minimum. But other side, there are some problems. What are the problems? Now come to the student's view. What are the problems that the students have to face? Number one, no direct contact with the teacher. So as you know that as being a teacher, eye contact is necessary for understanding a student's mind. Similarly, eye contact is necessary for a student to understand what teacher is actually delivering. But unfortunately, this e-learning system limited our eye to eye to eye and physical interaction that is a big problem and frequency and disrupt in the use of digital and educational tool 
due to the poor net connections and web disturbance sometimes the lecture get halted disrupted that is a very big problem for this system again teachers we teachers have some problems again the lack of direct contact the multiple procedure can be taken communications are mostly written so conversation is almost impossible here and difficulties in control the bad activities like cheating because some of we know that some people they just switch on the system come into the web or the learning tool and then keep it open and go some other places to do some other work so you can't you can't monitor all these activities so this is a problem and for the university there are some disadvantages fear of some learners investment in the purchase of the technical equipment companies have little or no information on the e learning tool and absence of incentive for some learners so this is the disadvantage for the university system there are a long history of the e learning if you look at the global platform e learning actually initiated in 1924 in europe and through some major changes in different time period it ultimately come to present scenario i am not going detail so e learning system and interactive platform system have certain criteria we which we actually need to comply first of all student interaction we have to increase the student interactions through mobile phone through web platform next method of instructions we have to modulate our method of instruction as well personal connections as we are not getting chance to conversate over the issues physically and we have no scope of eye contact so we have to go on personal contact or connections with the students to understand their individual problems teachers presence we need more and more accessible flexible teaching uh, module and teaching purposes online community we need to make some web pages or um, uh, whatsapp tool or telegram tool to make a community so that you teachers and you students could communicate easily at any time and can share your thought and it should be student driven because all this program can be designed keeping the spirit in mind that it is is actually for the benefit of the student so it should be a student driven program group work student need to consult together to make a solution on a given problems and activities and obviously sequencing that is sequential organizations and sequential interactions between teachers and student background design and multimodal object these are some of the area that we need to focus on presently our central government introduce a mooc that is massive open online courses under the flagship of ugc and we teachers can go through this mooc this is open choice system this is massive means there are maybe 1 lakh or 10 lakh students can be registered all together open system any time anywhere can register online system coursework is delivered entirely over the internet and courses are very similar most of the online college courses so it is an absolute flexible system and siam is a platform introduced by government of india in which mooc is the program and you people that is teachers both the teachers and both the students could register themselves in the siam to take the subject specific and core course specific learning module from there and this is some of the design of the e learning procedure made in the oxford cambridge and other us and uk based universities these are the multitudes of programming different nodes and their connections to mitigate the covid related limitations and uh, covid related imposement of different lockdown conditions so that's all about today and we hope that we will get back to the campus very soon that's all about my today's lecture thank you very much and if you have any questions you may ask
Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Ghosh. Uh, thanks a lot for a very enlightening presentation. I'm sure there will be uh, many questions, so I can already see a couple of them uh, in the comment box. But what we decided was, uh, since our second distinguished speaker, Dr. Oscar Franco, has already joined us, uh, we would like to welcome Dr. Franco to our webinar today. And I would also like uh, uh, Professor Shuparna Ganguly uh, to introduce Dr. Oscar Franco properly to our audience. Dr. Franco, uh, a very good evening to you and a very warm welcome to our webinar today. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for the kind invitation and, and thanks everyone that is uh, joining us today in this seminar. Uh, you're most welcome, sir. Uh, so, Shuparna, could you kindly introduce Dr. Franco? Am I audible? Yes. Thank you, Anuradha. I'm Shuparna Ganguly, Assistant Professor of Economics, Professor Chandra College. Uh, let me take this opportunity to introduce Dr. Oscar Franco, our esteem, uh, esteemed uh, speaker, the second panelist uh, to the audience. Professor Oscar H. Franco is the director of the Institute of Social and Preventive Medicine, ISPA, at the University of Bern, Switzerland. He is a full professor of epidemiology and public health at the University of Bern, adjunct professor at the University of Harvard and Erasmus MC. Professor Frank Franco is also scientific advisor for the national TV channel France 24. He has over 700 publications and an age index of 89 to his credit. Professor Franco obtained his MD at Pontificia Universidad de Veriana, Bogota in 1998. He moved to Netherlands to complete MSc and JSC degrees in clinical epidemiology and a PhD in public health and cardiovascular disease prevention at the Erasmus University Medical Center. Following a postdoc at Erasmus MC, he moved to the UK where he was a senior public health epidemiologist at Unilever England, assistant professor of public health at the University of Warwick and then Director of the MPhil program and clinical lecturer in public health at the University of Cambridge. In 2012, Professor Franco returned to Erasmus University Medical Center, where he worked as professor of preventive medicine, principal investigator of the cardiovascular epidemiology group, and director and founder of Erasmus H. A fellow of the European Society of Cardiology and St. Edmunds College at the University of Cambridge, Professor Franco was awarded the Dutch National Public Health Prize of 2005. I extend my hearty welcome to Dr. Franco and invite him to deliver his lecture. Over to you, Dr. Franco. Thank you, Dr. Ganguly. I'm going to share my screen. And I hope it's uh, working. Not yet, sir. Not, not yet, sir. Let's hope it uh, works. Uh, this, the screen is not yet visible, uh, Dr. Franco. I'm trying to uh, make it visible. If you give me a, a minute. Yes, yeah, sure, sure. Uh, well, I apologize for this. Uh, if uh, for all the audience that are watching us, um, I'm gonna keep on trying to share the screen. Otherwise, what I can do is to. Uh, share the presentation uh, via WeTransfer. I'm not sure why it's not working. Um,
just a second. Uh, system preferences. Security and privacy. So I apologize for everyone. I hope this is going to be solved soon. Um, that is not an issue. Please take your time, sir. Privacy. Um, I think I have to uh, log out and come back if you don't mind. No, uh, that is uh, absolutely fantastic, but Maybe I was just curious. Yes. Uh, would you like a word with uh, the person who is helping us with the technical support side uh, of this webinar? Would you like to I have a word with him regarding this? I think, or? I, think I can make it work if, if the previous speaker wants to take one or two questions, uh, I can come back uh, and try again. Yeah, sure. We can do that. We can do that. So um, uh, I think so. We'll take the questions of Dr. Ghosh's presentation first, and then you keep trying, and then you come back to us. Uh, hopefully, uh, the problems will be sorted by then. Hopefully, we make it work. Yes. Apologies yes, for yes. that. No, no. This is absolutely okay. Uh, so um, uh, I think, uh, as as it is clear, Dr. Professor Franco is having some issues with uh, sharing his screen with us. So under these circumstances, we think it's best to take the questions uh, uh, or, uh, related to Dr. Ghosh's presentation. And for this purpose, I would like to uh, 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 request Professor Piali Seth uh, from the Department of uh, Political Science, Prafula Chandra College, to take up uh, the questions regarding Dr. Ghosh's presentation. Piali, over to you, please. Yes. Uh, hello. Yes. Thank you, Anuradhi. Good evening, yes. everyone. And good evening, sir, uh, Dr. Ghosh. It was a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much again for that. So if you may, please, I am. Uh, may I just uh, put forward one question at a time? Or do you want them together? Professor Ghosh, do I put you put your question one one at a time? I think Piali, go ahead one at a time. That would be more convenient. Okay. okay. So uh, our listeners have really posed uh, many questions together, but uh, let me just begin with the first one. Uh, uh, one listener wanted to know that. Is there a difference between a child and an adult regarding the amount or the quality in which the COVID infection can affect him? A difference between the child and an adult. Uh, Piali, could you please uh, take the name of the person who posed the question? That would be in case he or she mentioned their names and designations. OK, uh, give me a minute. Is Dr. Ghosh here? I am I'm not very sure. I'm going to try to share the screen if you want. Maybe now it works. Um, I think, uh, Professor Franco, could you kindly wait a bit? Because uh, okay. we are not sure if the first uh, our first distinguished speaker is with us uh, live. Uh, OK, your screen is visible now. So what do we do, uh, Shuparna? What do we do? Uh, is I don't think Dr. Ghosh is with us right now, right? Right. So okay. Let us so, move on with the lecture. Uh, the yes, yes. Right. I think it would be then. Uh, Piali, sorry for the inconvenience, yes. but yeah. Uh, but as you can see, uh, uh, Professor. Uh, so we'll be taking the questions together at the end of this. Yes. Questions together yes. at the sure. end of uh, Professor Franco's lecture. So yes, Professor Franco, uh, uh, would you please kindly go ahead with your lecture? So thank you very much and apologies for the problems with the technology. That's one of the things that we have learned during this period of time is to catch up and understand all these uh, aspects of, of IT technology screens, etc. But would I, I would like to talk to you and I thank you very much for this kind of opportunity. Uh, and I would like to talk to you about the history of the pandemic 
And also, uh, we will be talking about what could be the next steps. And uh, also, I would like to share with you what has been my personal experience during the pandemic. Until now, uh, from my uh, number of publications that I have until March of this year, I had only four or five uh, publications that were related to infectious diseases. But since March, uh, together with the entire team, we have been working in trying to understand uh, how to manage this pandemic, how to deal with it in a better way. And we have been publishing as well a few uh, documents that I would like to share with you during this presentation. Let's start with history. And I would like to start here with uh, Mona Lisa, painted by Leonardo da Vinci between 1502 and 1506. And I always ask, uh, I would like to ask my audience to think about how would the Mona Lisa or Leonardo da Vinci um, look if they were exposed to the 21st century? Just for a while, uh, think how would she look like? Would the Mona Lisa look like this or perhaps like this? Maybe like this? Every time I, tell, I try to tell this story, somebody wants to spoil it and they tell me maybe uh, if Leonardo da Vinci would have been exposed to the 21st century, he wouldn't have painted the Mona Lisa, but maybe he would have uh, selected a different celebrity of the time and the Mona Lisa would have looked like this, or would have selected someone in the audience and would look like this, or maybe uh, one of the leaders of the response against coronavirus and the Mona Lisa would look like this. It actually, these days, should probably look more like this. And I like to use the Mona Lisa also to introduce you to one of the greatest successes of humankind. If we look at uh, record life expectancy throughout the world, uh, since records exist, so uh, we see in the last 150 years an increase of 45 years of life expectancy. This is equivalent to living five days and gaining a weekend. Or if you spend two hours in this uh, seminar, you will probably be gaining some 40 minutes. This has occurred uh, almost linearly, as you can see. And already in 2018, what we can see, Japan reached a record of 84.2 years. And in the future, we could perhaps have populations living on average more than 100 years. Just to remind you that life expectancy is the amount of years that a population on average can expect to remain alive, in this case, from birth. Overall, what we have seen here has been a dramatic increase a linear increase, thanks to improvements in sanitation, in, in hygiene, reductions in child mortality, and reductions in maternal mortality. But of all the experiences that have been recorded in this line, I would like to point out this red circle that I'm showing right now. And what you can see here is a big dip in the life expectancy. When I, when I ask my students when I'm lecturing, uh, what happened here, many of them say the Second World War, but actually the Second World War happened 20 years later. So another sense says it's the First World War. Well, it actually is a situation that many don't remember, but actually killed more people than the two World Wars put together. And that is La Gripe Española or the Spanish Flu. The Spanish Flu caused by influenza type A, uh, H1N1, was called a Spanish flu because it occurred during the time in which the world was at conflict. It was the time of the First World War. And many of the newspapers or the media did not make a lot of news about it because uh, the idea of the governments or the media was to keep the morale and the spirits of their armies and of the people high. And therefore, they didn't want to talk about this pandemic. However, in Spain, that was a neutral country, was one of the places where we first heard about the Spanish flu, and therefore it was called the Spanish flu. We see some of the first news on the 22nd of May of 1918. And we see also that during this year in 1918, the king of Spain uh, had the Spanish flu and become, became very prominent in the news about the situation that was occurring in this country. However, the pandemic was occurring throughout the world and not just in Spain. These are the typical pictures that we see uh, when we talk about Spanish flu or when we look for the Spanish flu in Google, and you will see these very large hospitals um, that look like campaign hospitals, military hospitals, with a lot of young people aged 20 or 30, uh, had severely affected by a respiratory condition that killed many of them, because many of the deaths 
were around this age, 20, 30 years old. We also see uh, what was called a new normality that we want to call now, and the use of masks in that time uh, became not, not only an issue, but also a campaign. And there was also people that were supporting the use of masks or were against the use of masks. And we can see how it affected also the, the sports of that time. This is for those that are familiar with baseball. That I know you like cricket probably more than baseball. This is a team in Boston, the Red Sox. And you can see here they're wearing a mask during their practice. And also the umpire here, the referee, as well as all the people that are in the audience are wearing a mask. So this was a situation that was lived more than 100 years ago. The Spanish flu actually did not come from Spain. It was, as I said, first uh, become, became uh, popular in the media in Spain, but it actually came from Kansas, from Fort Riley. Here we can see a picture of Fort Riley and a number of doctors that were being trained and prepared to be sent to Europe for the First World War. And was here in Fort Riley that in 1916, 1917, were the first uh, cases detected. Also, we have seen recently how phylogenetic analysis or analysis of where the virus come from points out that this virus came initially from wild birds uh, in North America, or maybe it went through horses. Uh, there was a great zoonotic epidemic by the end of the, of the previous century and maybe came from horses into the wild bears or the wild bears went to horses. It's not very clear how this happened and then it affected humans. So these uh, troops brought the disease with them uh, to, the front, uh, to the trenches to where the First World War was actually occurring. It passed it first to the troops of the Allies and then through the enemies and it had a great impact in how the conflict developed. In total, there were four waves of the Spanish flu um, it lasted from 1918 until 1920. The first wave was here in spring 1918, killing approximately 10% of the total victims. Then the big wave happened in the autumn of 1918, killing approximately 65% of all the victims accumulated. And this is when uh, the virus spread further uh, after the conflict or during the, conf during the final uh, periods of the, of the First World War, towards the Southern Hemisphere and went to Asia and went to uh, Latin America as well. Then there was a third wave in the spring of 1919 and the final one in 1920. It played a very important role on how the conflict was uh, resolved. Many people think that the Spanish flu brought an end to the conflict and also set up the second conflict that happened 20 years later, the Second World War. We can see here, this is the Treaty of Versailles or the Treaty of Peace of Versailles uh, that was signed in France. And we see here the Prime Minister David Lloyd George from UK, Vittorio Orlando from Italy. We also see George Clemenceau, Prime Minister of France and Woodrow Wilson that was the President of the United States of America. These countries uh, were trying to define the terms of the agreement to end with the First World War. By the end of 1918, um, the armistice has been already established. There was a clear winner, and David Lloyd George entering uh, up, uh, it seems entering Manchester towards the end of 1918, became infected by the Spanish flu as well. He was uh, 55 years old then. He survived the Spanish flu uh, nevertheless. Later on, when they were in Paris, uh, we can see the leaders here, uh, Clemenceau was pushing very strongly to have some terms that were very strong against the Germans. But uh, the president of the United States was not very supportive of. However, uh, Woodrow Wilson, president of the United States, become, became also infected by Spanish flu and apparently had a neurological complication from this infection. Some people thought he was having a stroke, but his behavior changed and he allowed Clemenceau to establish very severe terms against the Germans in the signing of this treaty. Therefore, that's why we say that the Spanish flu probably ended with the First World War I, uh, but set up the, the conditions to establish the Second World War. In total, uh, the Spanish flu affected 50 to 60% of the entire pop world population. And the world population in that time was close to 2 billion, while now we have 8 billion. One or 2% of those infected died, and in total, 
there is an estimate that it killed approximately 40, 50 million people. Some people say it was 20, some people say it was 100, but it killed approximately 50 million people. It also killed many people in India. It killed approximately 12 or 30 million people in India. It arrived first to Mumbai and it was brought, uh, it's, it is believed, by the soldiers from India that were fighting at the First World War where they acquired the virus and brought it back to India. From Mumbai, it spread throughout the country uh, through their commercial rules and the different transportation rules within the country, and it affected a lot of people. What we see is that uh, viruses and pandemics are not democratic and they don't affect everyone the same. And it tend to affect, and it was also the case, as we can see in this report from Mumbai, it tended to affect those that were in the lower socioeconomic status and affected the least, the Europeans, British mostly, that were living in that time in India under very good conditions compared to those uh, living in very poor conditions. So it killed most the lowest class people. Also in that time, there was a lot of discussion whether to establish quarantines and for how long. And there was large difference in how the quarantines were established. We can see here a number of cities, Philadelphia, San Francisco, New York, and St. Louis. Um, we see, for example, Philadelphia, how it established a quarantine, which is this shadow blue here that you see uh, during the process of the increase of the virus, a little bit late. Uh, it was a severe quarantine, but it was established after uh, a protest, a, a massive uh, manifestation took place uh, in order to manifest about the First World War in the city. Uh, we see a very large peak of that in Philadelphia that then decreased. On the other hand, we see a city like St. Louis that established a quarantine quite early with a lot less uh, number of contagions than Philadelphia. It took a while, here we can see the quarantine, and then it released, despite that the virus was still circulating. And what St. Louis saw was uh, coming back a second wave with a lot of cases that affected them later. So also 100 years ago, we had the same discussion where to establish the quarantine, where to establish it early or late, whether to allow manifestations or not, and how to avoid uh, a second wave. That is one of the topics that we talk quite often about the, the COVID-19 situation of today. Influenza, as we see, has been around the world for a long time. Uh, uh, the first recorded epidemic took place in 1173. Uh, then it was brought by Christophorus Columbus when uh, he discovered America and brought a different uh, Spanish uh, colonizers and discoverers to the continent in the year 1493. In 1510, in an uh, epidemic that took place in Italy, um, the name influenza was used, and influenza refer about the influence from gods or the influence from the planets that was having this uh, type uh, of infection or epidemic taking place. In 1918, we saw the Spanish flu by the virus influenza type A, H1N1, virus that continue affecting humankind, but then disappeared in 1957, and then was replaced by another type of virus, the H2N2, and then came back in 1977 with another epidemic of H1N1. And what was curious was that this virus of 1977 was exactly the same as the virus of 1957. And this is curious because the influenza virus tends to mutate quite often. So you wouldn't expect that in 20 years you will have exactly the same virus. And it seems that what happened was that this virus of 1957 the type of virus that affected the population of the great pandemic of 1918 with the Spanish flu disappeared but was frozen in a lab. And then in 1977, either by an accidental release or not so accidental that took place in a lab, either in China or in Russia, it spread throughout the world and caused a new pandemic. So these situations are not new and we see a lot of discussion nowadays whether the virus of COVID-19 comes from a lab or not. What we see is that uh, this influenza type A is still circulating, H -N 
H H1 N1, and it's always the fear that whether it's gonna cause a new pandemic. We saw the latest pandemic with H1 N1 in 2009 with the swine flu uh, pandemic that killed more than 500,000 people. And maybe you saw in the news a recent publication where a group from China that had been uh, investigating during the last uh, 10 years uh, the population of, of pigs in China, in 11 provinces of China, uh, they found a new type of influenza that is a genotype for Euro-Asian H1N1. It's a combination of bird flu uh, from the Euro-Asian uh, variant uh, and a combination with the H1N1 virus that caused the pandemic of 2009 that uh, recombined uh, together uh, within this population of pigs. And now is the prominent uh, variant, the G4EAH1N1, that is affecting the pigs. And uh, there is a, a large fear because uh, it was found that it already jumped species. It already can affect humans. Nevertheless, we haven't seen yet human transmission. For that reason, there was all over the news that maybe this new type of swine flu could have a pandemic potential and hopefully it's not going to start transmitting between humans and it's not going to cause a new pandemic. If we look in history, the big pandemics, uh, the Spanish flu killed approximately 50 million, Black Death killed between 25 and 50 million, and the Justinian plague killed, uh, this was in the time of the Roman Empire, killed between 25 and 100 million. And the question was always, when is the new one going to arrive? We thought perhaps SARS in 2002, we thought of swine flu in 2009, then MERS in 2012. Also, uh, the crisis that we saw with Ebola in 2014 made us wonder if this was going to be the new large pandemic. But the question was always there, when is it going to come, where is it going to happen, and how? And they take us to this city, the city of Wuhan. This is Li Wenlian, uh, an ophthalmologist working in Wuhan, that the 30th of December worried because so he saw some cases of pneumonia of unknown origin, but that was related to a coronavirus similar to SARS. He sent a message in uh, the Chinese WhatsApp that is called WeChat. He sent it to a group of friends from his school of medicine. This message became viral and it was sent over and over and over. We can see the 30th of December, 2019 in the night. This is one of the messages that was uh, forwarded from his message. He said, hi everyone. My friend in infectious disease told me not to go to the Huanan seafood market. There has been a cluster of unknown pneumonia. Today, we admitted multiple patients from Huanan seafood market. And this became viral and uh, spread the news and the government uh, censored the message that Li Wenlian was giving. Let's look at the map of Wuhan. This is a very large city right in the middle of China. And as you can see, divided by the great Yangtze River, which is one of the largest rivers in the world and perhaps the largest in China. As we can see here, this is where the Central Hospital of Wuhan is, where Dr. Li Wenlian worked. And here is the Huanan Seafood Market, where he was sending in the message that people shouldn't go. And very close to the Huanan Seafood Market, that is also very close to the hospital, is here the Hankou Railway Station. Here also is the famous Wuhan Institute of Variology, and here the Wuhan Centers of Disease Prevention and Control. They will come back in this history. This is a picture of the Hankou Railway Station, and this is how you can imagine that looks inside when it is at one of its peak times. So there is a very a lot of contact between people. And this is a picture of the Huanan Seafood Market where it was believed that the virus originated this is a menu from the Huanan Seafood Market, and all over the media was these pictures of a soup with bats, because in this seafood market, also all kinds of wild animals can be purchased for consumption. This is the actual menu, and as you can see, there is a large variety. Soon after the pandemic uh, was established, or the pandemic was developing, in February, there was a publication from the from this group, from the Wuhan Institute of Virology, uh, that was highlighting how the closest ancestor of the current uh, virus that is affecting and causing the pandemic was uh, could be linked to a bat, uh, to a coronavirus that affect uh, bats. 
So it was, it was thought that perhaps that virus was coming from this bat and that this bat to get, uh, was uh, being stored together with other wild animals in this market. And perhaps it passed it to an animal that is called the pangolin. And from the pangolin, it further adapted to affect humans. And then it went to affect humans. However, this theory of uh, this market being the origin is practically now uh, no longer in place. And the reason for this is uh, multiple first, uh, because of the 300 or more uh, samples that were taken uh, from the market, uh, only 30 became positive. And of this, none came from the animals. And it seemed that, it, that they were, the virus was there either through contamination, through sewage, sewage waters, or from workers or visitors. And also, in an independent research carried by the Sunday Times, a newspaper in the, in the UK, they found how this uh, ancestor, this, this, uh, this close ancestor to this virus that was published in February 2020, was already published in 2016 from a sample that was taken from an abandoned mine here in the south of China, 1,500 kilometers away from Wuhan. This was an incident in 2012. There were six workers in a, in a copper mine that had a pneumonia, three of them died, and all of, they, all of them required intensive care unit treatment. They had a pneumonia with symptoms similar to COVID-19. And the investigators from this uh, lab in Wuhan went to the south of China, they took some samples, they sent it to the, back to the lab, and when they analyzed the samples, they found this type of uh, new coronavirus that uh, resembled quite closely 97%, 96%, to the current virus that affects, uh, that produces COVID-19. So it is possible that the virus was circulating uh, for years, perhaps for decades. It is possible that it indeed came from bats, passed another, into another species, and through trade was brought back to this market in uh, Wuhan. But there is also hypothesis that perhaps it was uh, in the experiments or the samples that was in the lab in Wuhan that uh, the virus was accidentally um, um, managed and accidentally re released. Still, there is a lot of many hypotheses about the origin, uh, and we still have to wait to determine this. Now, I'm going to share with you what happened in Wuhan and how was this managed. And this is all based by a publication in JAMA by one uh, very good friend, Anpan, from Wuhan and some of his colleagues. And basically what they did, they divided what happened in Wuhan in five phases. The first phase is here. Uh, the first confirmed case uh, started with symptoms in the 1st of December. And then during December, there was a number of cases of pneumonia. Many of them linked, uh, two thirds were linked to the Huanan seafood market, but one third was not linked to this uh, seafood market. There is also um, a lot of uh, rumors about uh, that the virus was perhaps circulating earlier. There was a publication from Harvard talking about how um, through satellite images, they, they saw that the parking lots of the hospitals in Wuhan were busy since October. And there was also reports of athletes that attended the, the World Military Summer Games in Wuhan that took place in October 2019, that they argued that they got uh, infected uh, while being in these military games. These are nevertheless, nevertheless just uh, rumors and nothing has been confirmed yet. It is in December 30 when then uh, China is uh, confirming that there is a number of uh, unknown cases of pneumonia and then the alarm is raised. Dr. Li Wenlian was told uh, not to continue spreading these rumors. He was suspended from his work. At the beginning of January 2020, he came back to his office and he became infected with coronavirus, uh, apparently January 8th, when he had a patient coming from the Huanan Seafood Market. The second phase is determined by a massive migration that is called the Chunjun period. The Chunjun period, the Chunjun migration, occurs around the Chinese New Year, 15 days before and approximately 20, 25 days after the Chinese New Year. And this is the largest annual migration in the world. It is during this point of time where the worries and the alarms start to appear because this virus was spreading and the migration certainly helped. The happy new year of 2020, the year of the rat, the, the rat, the, the metal rat, 
uh, was being clouded by this occurrence. This was expected to take place in January 25. And as you can imagine, Wuhan being here right in the middle of China and being right in the middle of the major rail connections was at the center of a lot of traffic and could have meant a lot of spread. It is expected or is considered that approximately 5 million people left uh, China and brought perhaps the virus to other locations. What we see during this period of time, during the Chungyun uh, time, is that there were 1,476 billion trips that were made in China. This was, however, 50% less than the previous year. There were 38 million flights. So as you can imagine, there was a very large movement. During this period of time as well, it was clear that the, the virus that was uh, affecting or was behind this disease, uh, it was identified. Its genetic sequence was um, produced or was made possible with this, uh, by this lab in Wuhan. And it was identified as a beta type of coronavirus, similar, 80% similar to SARS-CoV, the virus that had caused um, the epidemic of 2002. Also from the same family of the MERS, um, of the MERS epi uh, virus that had caused uh, an epidemic earlier. And it was called um, SARS-CoV-2 because very, it was very similar to SARS-CoV. Also very soon we saw how this virus utilized the ACE2 uh, receptors to enter the cells. And that brought a lot of worries uh, because these same receptors are very important for, for the management of hypertension and for its treatment. And this was one of our first publications where we look at whether this could be uh, an issue because hypertension, treatment for hypertension, and the influence of the virus could generate a double burden for the populations. In this publication of the Lancet that was uh, later retracted, this is the publication of hydroxychloroquine that became quite infamous. Uh, we see how already in that information, there is no effect. If you have here something to, towards this side of the figure, there will be an increased risk. But what we can see here is that ACE inhibitors and adjutensin receptor blockers did not seem to have an effect. And therefore the advice from quite early was for hypertensive populations not to stop taking their antihypertensives. The third, um, the third phase of the pandemic or the epidemic in this case in Wuhan was uh, marked by the by this new year in China. The authorities had to take a very difficult decision because new year in China is something very important. A lot of families reunite, a lot of families celebrate, and they had to declare on two days, two days before the Chinese New Year, the cordon sanitaire, basically they needed to lock the entire city down and not allow anyone in or anyone out. Besides the city lockdown, the traffic was suspended and everybody was asked to stay at home. One of the concerns that they had uh, was that uh, homes and apartments in Wuhan can be small and therefore there could be close contact between families or within the household. So uh, during this period of time, the third phase of the epidemic in Wuhan, the authorities started to produce and to prepare for what will happen later. During this time, the 30th of January, the WHO declared a global emergency. And the 31st of January, the USA restricted flights from China. And the first cases of Italy in Italy were reported, which were two tourists that came from China to Milan, and then they were diagnosed in Rome. This is a street in Wuhan. As you can see, there is a lot of traffic. And this is what happened after the cordon sanitaire and the traffic suspension. As you can see here, a lot of towers with apartments where people tend to live very cramped with each other. So in the fourth phase, what they introduced was a concept that was called centralized quarantine. It was clear that a lot of clusters were happening within families and within the same household. So it was important to separate people from their communities and their families. And so for this, they also needed to improve um, their medical resources uh, and to improve the facilities that they could use to isolate people. We saw during this time as well, the first death outside China, a Philippine man, age 44, who was also infected with flu and he died 
out of the COVID-19 complications. And the 7th of February, we saw that unfortunately, Liv and Lian at age 33 died from COVID-19. Many of you saw these pictures with a lot of work, construction work being done. Uh, people were wondering whether this was mass graves, but basically what they were doing was constructing a very large hospital within a few days. And what we saw here is that within a couple of days, within five, 10 days, uh, two new hospitals were built, one with 1,000 beds and one with 1,600 beds that were added to the already ample network of hospitals that existed in the city of Wuhan. Besides this, there was a new type of hospital or a new type of shelter built that was called the Fangkang or R hospitals. These were large temporary hospitals. They used things like stadiums or auditoriums, and they were converted into a shelter where they will isolate patients with mild symptoms from their families and communities. If these patients will get worse, then they will be sent to the hospitals. And here they will receive medical care. You can see here, maybe very small in the picture, the doctors, they will receive food, they will receive protection, and they will also be uh, given a lot of uh, social activities to maintain quality of mental health. During this period of time, confirmed patients were sent to hospital, presumptive patients were tested uh, to confirm. Uh, patients with fever or respiratory symptoms uh, were also taken to these Fangkang hospitals, and the close contacts were isolated either in hotels or in these ARC hospitals. The fifth phase, besides the centralized quarantine, saw a universal symptom survey that took place in three days. For a city of 10, 11 million people, this is a great accomplishment because they were door to door looking for people that could have symptoms and testing people. By the 11th of February, uh, the World Health Organization had already confirmed the name uh, COVID-19, and the virus was identified and named as SARS-CoV-2. And the 23rd of February, Italy and Iran uh, started to increase in the number of cases. We uh, talk in epidemics about the R, or the rep effective reproductive number. Uh, that is uh, basically the speed in which contagion can occur. And as you can see here, uh, right at the beginning in the early stage, it approximate uh, between three and four. When the massive migration occurred without strong interventions, it continued to be above three. And when the city lockdown occurred, you see a massive drop of the speed of contagion. And then with the centralized quarantine, it was brought below one. When it is brought below one, the disease starts to be contained. The epidemic starts to be contained and it slowly disappears. And then here in the fifth phase with the universal symptom survey and the continuation of the centralized quarantine, the RT, the, the speed of the contagion, decrease and decrease until the epidemic subsided. A lot of things we learned from the experience of Wuhan. One of these was uh, based on this speed of contagion. We calculated that approximately the speed of contagion, one person will infect 2.5 people within five days. And this will mean 406 people in 30 days. If we were to reduce this by 50%, instead of infecting 406 people in 30 days, only 15 people will be infected. And if this is reduced even more, then only 2.5 people in a month will be infected. And this was key because the idea of social distancing was that the epidemic curve, as you can see here, will become more flat. And therefore, it will not overcome the healthcare system and the healthcare system will be able to cope with the situation. Also, a lot of things we learned during the experience in China. Uh, we learned how important it was to wash our hands, to maintain respiratory hygiene, and also to avoid particip participating in large gatherings, not to spit in public, and not to touch our faces. What we saw then is, uh, we can see here a picture from the last day of the Fangan hospitals. This is uh, one of the healthcare workers and one of the patients saying goodbye. And we saw then the end of the epidemic in China. And throughout February, March, April, and May, and June, 
China has been very stable without a dramatic increase in cases. China was instead replaced by Europe, and we can see here in Spain and Italy, with a very fast increase in the number of cases and the circumstances that then took place in Spain and Italy. Then in March 11, the WHO declared this as a pandemic. And around that same day, uh, I had uh, lunch with someone who later uh, confirmed that perhaps had coronavirus. In that time, they were not doing the test. And therefore, I had to isolate myself in my attic. I don't complain, but I had to spend here 14 days without contact with my family uh, in order to protect them. During this period of time, I started to uh, focus every time more and more and more in doing research regarding uh, how to stop, uh, how to handle the pandemic and how to help people. At the same time, I started to post uh, educational notes in social media. And also I was approached by France 24, which is one of the national channels uh, in the country of France. And I was invited to participate as one of the scientific advisors and to have a program in their channel. During this period of time as well, we started to become every time more concerned about the effect that quarantines were having in people. And we wrote this paper that is called the forgotten priorities of the pandemic, because everybody was talking about contagion, about R, reproductive numbers, and our infections, but uh, not considering the mental health issues that were being caused by the pandemic, the stress, the anxiety, depression, insomnia, that has caused in many, not only in those that suffer the disease, but also in their family members and everyone that has been in a quarantine or that has been affected by the situation. As well, vulnerable populations such as indigenous populations, elderly people in prisons, or uh, people living with disabilities were largely in ignored. And we need to understand that uh, COVID-19, what we see in terms of deaths, hospitalizations, and of confirmed cases is just the tip of the iceberg. The disease per se has a huge amount of unaccounted death, uh, asymptomatic with uh, consequences that are not being detected. And adding to that, the number of people that are being affected in their mental health, uh, economic consequences, poverty, hunger, but as well, people with chronic diseases that are not being screened for cancer or that are not being treated for their, for their tumors or people with cardiovascular disease or people that don't want to go to a hospital and can't die at home from other circumstances because they are afraid of being infected. Also, during this time, um, there was at the beginning of the, of the epidemic or the pandemic, there was a report that the red eye was a common sign in people that would suffer uh, from coronavirus uh, uh, in, in these times. And also there was a lot of questions whether it could be uh, passed through the eyes. And we found later on that indeed there were receptors uh, in the eye that uh, were susceptible to be affected by the virus. Also, we had been working a lot uh, with the screens uh, behind a computer. Uh, so uh, we wrote this paper, Eye Health in Older People at the Time of Corona, where we tried to provide some tips of how to maintain a good vision. Because a lot of people by being all the time locked up and working in the screens are having problems with vision and vision is something that is failing in many other parts of the world. And uh, we saw also uh, some of our leaders uh, being clouded and having issues accepting or understanding the effects of the pandemic and the effects of the epidemic in their countries. And with time, what we saw is the disease went from being mainly in China to uh, spread into Europe and then uh, right now we have 55, 60% of cases in the American continent where United States, Brazil and Mexico are still the ones uh, most affected also together with Peru and Chile. And in Asia, we see India and Iran be being greatly affected. We see here how Brazil has become the second country most affected and the epidemic in India that has been in a constant rise. This is the last month, as we can see from the 1st of July to July 19, the amount of daily cases in India has constantly increased, uh, coming to numbers of above 35,000 per day. 
and the da number of uh, daily deaths in India has had been ranging between 400 and 700 almost during this period of time. The epidemic continues to increase. We can see here the situation in India. January 30, the first report is uh, the, fir the first case of coronavirus is reported. The first death is reported on March 13. The world was surprised by the introduction of a nationwide lockdown, uh, the biggest lockdown in the world on March 25. Um, that lasted, that was implemented when the contagions were not uh, that high and that lasted here and was then released. The first ease, ease of uh, restrictions occurred on June 8, while the contagion continued to increase exponentially. And the first of July were the second phase of restrictions released. And we can see here the contagion contagion include increasing and increasing dramatically and in July uh, 17 India reached more than 1 million cases. The diseases are spread uh, heterogeneously throughout the country. We see again here uh, Maharashtra and Tamil Nadu, some of the states most affected. Mumbai has approximately 25 percent of the cases and Delhi has uh, the largest number of cases per capita of anywhere in India. This is the situation uh, as uh, this morning. And as we can see, India here is number three in number of uh, most cases. Uh, nevertheless, um, if we look at the number of deaths per capita, is not in the largest, uh, is not in the top. The number of deaths has been 27,540. And we need to remember that the population of India is very large, of course, as you know. Here is the amount of uh, increase, percentage of increase in the last week of the number of deaths. And we can see India in the 10th position uh, and still with the number of deaths per million population of 19.43. If we compare it to Chile, where it is 441.6. So a lot of discussion has been uh, going around about will there be a second wave? Uh, will cold, hot climate affect uh, the pandemic? Will cold climate affect the virus? And I would like to answer these two questions with one single slide. And this is the situation in Iran. We see here in Iran, Norus, uh, which is the new year of Iran, occurred the 20th of March. And we can see here a very steep increase. Restrictions were then implemented and the reopening was made too soon. And we can see here a second wave already taking place in Iran. Does hot weather may play a role in the behavior of the virus? We need to take into account that when this increase was occurring, the temperature in Iran, in Tehran, was 37 degrees. It was pretty hot. So I don't think the weather is going to have an important impact in the virus and the behavior. We have seen also second waves being reported in other countries, uh, has been started in Israel, in Australia, uh, in Japan, it seems to be a second wave starting in Luxembourg and in Serbia. Has the virus mutated? That's a question that uh, many people make. Is the virus mutating? Can it mutate? Has it changed? All viruses mutate and this virus also mutates. It doesn't mutate as often as the influenza virus. It's estimated that it mutates approximately twice per month. And we have seen in this report uh, earlier on how the original variant that was causing the, the beginning of the epidemic and the pandemic in Wuhan, the variant was called D614, has been replaced almost entirely by another variant, the G614. This variant has four mutations in the spike protein where it uses the virus to enter the cell. And it was first, um, without the four mutations, with, the, with three mutations, was first detected in Wuhan, but with the four mutations was first detected in February 20 in Italy. Ever since, soon, in a, in a matter of days, it has started to affect 10% of the, of the infections throughout the world. It moved from Europe uh, to North, America to Oceania to Asia and to Latin America within a month it covered 65% of the infections and we can see here is 
almost 98, 99 percent of the infections. Basically, the pandemic now is uh, being caused by a completely different variant that has basically pushed away the old variant of Wuhan. And this new variant is more infections. It's approximately three to nine times more infections than the previous variant. It is not clear yet whether it is more severe. It has been compared in the UK. They took some patients that had the old variant and some patients that had the new variant. They compared them that they didn't find a difference in severity. We still have to see whether severity will be affected. What will be the next steps? This is one of the concerns that I have. This is a picture of me with my son. And one of the concerns that uh, we have is what, what should we do with children? As schools have been closed. We don't know whether to reopen. So what is the situation in children? All over the world, it has been reported that children are less affected or are affected with less severity. And this was what we thought until one day in April, where there was this notification by the NHS in London where a number of cases of diseases similar to the Kawasaki syndrome were reported in a dozen of children. In that time, we didn't know whether it was linked to the virus or not, but we are seeing now it is, it is that is a multisystemic inflammatory syndrome and is being caused by the virus that causes COVID-19. That causes COVID it has been reported in uh, other places, in uh, United States, uh, in Spain, etc. So we see that children can be affected severely, but the proportion of children that can suffer from this type of syndrome is very low. Why are children being less affected? One of the theories, and this is a study published in JAMA in May 20, uh, they found, these investigators found a lower nasal gene expression of the receptor that is used by the virus to enter the cells. And we see that the expression increases with age. This is one of the theories. Another theory is that also in the lungs, the expression of these uh, receptors in children is less and increases with age. This, however, hasn't been confirmed. And another theory is that the children respond and their inflammatory response is different and they might have less of the disorganized uh, response that we had called the cytokine storm that has been related to many complications and death in adults. This is a study in the Netherlands, and they looked at whether uh, who was infecting whom. And basically what they found is that the majority of the infections were being brought by uh, young adults. And this is what I call the taxi of the coronavirus, because young people, uh, they think that they are not going to be affected so severely, and indeed they are not affected so severely, but they can be infected. And what they do is because they mobilize so much, they can bring the virus to their parents or to their grandparents or to their neighbors that are the ones that are gonna probably going to have most complications and die. And the situation in Asia regarding school closures, as we can see, is the majority of places have uh, some level of closure, except for countries such as Laos, Vietnam, uh, where uh, the disease has been managed. And now, uh, because the contagion is so low, the schools have been reopened. There's been a lot of studies uh, uh, to decide how to reopen schools. And this is from the UK. Uh, basically, if all the schools, if the schools are reopened fully, we see that the contagion will jump again. But if, if it's open by turns where some children come and some children don't, or primary school is open or secondary school is open and not primary, this could be uh, implemented. And we need to understand that the schools are very important. Uh, because they are not just for a study, but also can be a place of shelter, of food, and also a lot of education and social interaction. And children are also suffering a lot by the quarantine and the restrictions. This is how things are being done in the UK and in Europe. Uh, but we can see here is maintaining distance, trying to implement hygiene, having checks of temperature, protecting teachers with a face mask, uh, keeping distances from their desk. We see here a teacher uh, in Germany measuring the distances between the desk. In Wuhan uh, and in China, uh, students have returned to classes with a mask and using um, a protection. And we can see graduation here in Japan that was done virtually with robots. As we can see, the disease continues. Um, we have seen some countries that had reopened. 
And we can see, for example, the case of Spain and the case of Switzerland that had a number of phases of reopening. Let's focus, for example, on Switzerland. As you can see here, the number of infections had reduced dramatically during April and May. So in April 27, they started to open hairdressers, uh, garden centers. In May 11, primary and lower secondary schools uh, were open. Also, all shops were open on May 11. And then on June 8, the zoos, the uh, gatherings of more than five people were allowed. And on June 15, the borders were open. Since the opening of the borders in June 15, we are starting to see an increase in the number of cases in Switzerland as well. However, this decrease, this increase is still is, uh, seems to be under control and we're still waiting whether a second wave might come or not to Switzerland. What is important from what we have seen in the experiences of Spain and Switzerland is that it's important to open gradually, step by step, and to allow people to get used to the different phases of the reopening measures. So what is going to be the long-term solutions? What should we expect for the pandemic? Immunity. Let's talk about group immunity and cross immunity. We heard probably a lot about herd immunity. Herd immunity is a concept in which basically you have a large proportion of the population infected. The other proportion of people are protected because the contagion chain is going to be cut. Basically, there won't be contagion. The likelihood of getting infected is going to be lower. It has been estimated that uh, 60 or 70 percent of the population will need to be infected so that the herd immunity can take place with this disease. However, we are still very far from that level of herd immunity. The city with the biggest level is New York City with 19 percent uh, of antibodies in the population. A city like Wuhan only has 10 percent. A city like Stockholm in Sweden, only 7%, despite that the Stockholm did not have such severe measures of quarantine. And in Spain, a country that has been so affected by uh, coronavirus, the entire population was observed in one of the largest ser serological studies that the level of antibodies in the population was approximately 5%. The biggest number was in Madrid, 11.3, and in Barcelona, 7%. So we seem to be still very far from herd immunity. However, we need to remember that immunity has different types. And one is the innate immunity. That's the immunity that you are born with. It's a number of barriers that we have, cells, skin, etc. cetera. Uh, and there is also acquired immunity. And the acquired immunity can be humoral. This is through antibodies, as we saw in the previous slide. Or it can be through lymphocytes T, that can be cellular immunity. And we saw a publication recently from a group in Sweden, in Karolinska, that shows that T cell immunity appeared to have occurred already in twice as many people as there has been antibodies. So it seems that the level of immunity can be larger than expected. Also, there is an aspect that is called cross immunity. And we saw in this report from uh, INCEL, cross immunity means that once you are exposed to a virus, you keep your cells, your lymphocytes T can keep some level of memory that when another virus that is similar might come, even if it's not the same, these cells can be reactivated. We have seven different types of coronavirus. Four of these types of coronavirus are circulating every year. They are endemic and they produce a common cold. So this, this scientists tested whether the exposure to this common coronavirus, this common cold, could actually protect for the new coronavirus. And they found that this could actually be the case. So maybe through T cell immunity and through cross immunity, we might have good news. What is the situation with the vaccine? Developing a vaccine takes many years. In average, can take 10 to 15 years. Um, however, because of technology and because of the knowledge that we have acquired, it is expected that uh, multiple vaccines have been advancing and had been succeeding at a faster pace than ever before in history. Some people think that maybe a vaccine will be ready in the next half of 2020 and ready for distribution in 2021. There is a very large competition. Uh, China has two vaccines. One of them has been approved uh, for use in the military uh, members of China. 
Uh, the UK University of Oxford, together with AstraZeneca, is also developing a vaccine. Pfizer is also developing a vaccine. A company like Moderna is also developing a vaccine. And there is a lot of discussion who is going to be first. India has also developed their own vaccine. Uh, it's called Covaxin, and it's uh, produced by a company called Bharat in Hyderabad in collaboration with the Ministry of Health and the Institute, National Institute of Virology of India. What they are uh, showing is for now, so are very promising results. In July, they have started phase one and phase two studies combined. And what is expected is that perhaps if this, va if this vaccine work, India could have its own vaccine by 2021. In terms of treatment, there has been a lot of discussions. Uh, the principle of testing, tracing, and isolating remains, and this is the most important principle. And there has been a lot of many medications that have been discussed. We have remdesivir, which is an antiviral drug that seems to reduce by 30 to 40% the duration of the infection, and is one of the most promising. It was all over the news because the American government bought um, the, almost the entire uh, number of remdesivir available uh, to distribute within this own population. There is also another antiviral agent that is called favipiravir, which is a drug developed by the company Fujifilm or Toyama Chemical in Japan. It became a generic in 2019 and is being produced by different countries. Among those, Russia is producing it and it's called uh, afibavir. And this is being sold to different countries in the world as a potential treatment that could reduce the duration of the disease. Nevertheless, phase three evaluation of this medication is still undergoing. Also, there's been a lot of uh, publicity about dexamethasone, which was found to be beneficial only for severe patients that are hospitalized and being ventilated. It seems to reduce mortality. And another type of medications has been uh, anakinra, which is an inhibitor of the interleukin receptor one, or actemra, this, which is an inhibitor of the interleukin uh, receptor 6. And these two medications could be utilized where severe and discontrolled uh, inflammation might take place. So this could help in patients in a second phase of the disease where more severe um, situations might occur. This might help to reduce complications and it has been shown to reduce mortality as well. Convalescent plasma has also been discussed. This is plasma from people that have already had the disease they can give the antibodies to patients so that they could combat the disease. And there has been a lot of discussion whether hydroxychloroquine works or not. Every time there is more and more studies showing that it doesn't seem to work, but still there is not a lot of clarity whether it given early could work or not. There's also a lot of discussion recently about the drug called phenofibrate because uh, it has been shown that the virus could be affected by this drug but it still is very early studies. And there's been a lot of discussions about ibuprofen, which at the beginning it was recommended not to give, and now it's being studied as a potential solution, but it still is very early. And about ivermectin, which um, only had uh, some in vitro uh, results that shown from a group in Australia that perhaps ivermectin could help uh, in reducing the replication of the virus. But what we are seeing is regions in the world that are taking and taking ivermectin without having any evidence. We still don't know whether it works and it should not be taken. To end, we also have non-pharmacological measures. As you know, um, having quarantines, uh, having a sustained quarantine is something that is not uh, possible. So we publish in this study a potential strategy in which people will keep a quarantine for a number of days, let's say 40 or 50, followed by a relaxation period of 30 days, and then coming back to uh, quarantine. This is what we call dynamic measures. And we did it in 16 different countries, including countries such as Australia, Bangladesh, or Afghanistan. And furthermore, we also publish uh, potential long-term strategies uh, that will be combination of sustained mitigation, sonar lockdown, or rolling lockdowns or dynamic measures in which uh, a quarantine is being implemented for a period of time and then released. Well, let's hope uh, that advances in treatment, a new vaccination, and time will allow us to say goodbye to this situation. Right now, the world is like this, completely affected by the situation. Um, 
worried about what is going to happen and discussing whether to wear or not to wear mask while we are showing every time more evidence that masks are important. Hopefully in the future, we are going to move towards a planet in which more solidarity will take place and in which we will take better care of planetary health. Uh, I would like to end my presentation by sharing with you some pictures of our office. Uh, this is the Institute of Social and Preventive Medicine in Bern. And this is the city of Bern. And whatever you want to come to Switzerland or whenever you come to Bern, uh, I hope to uh, see you there. So with this, I would like to end my presentation and I'm open to receive any questions. Thank you, Dr. Franco, for your very informative presentation. I am Raktakar Pani, principal of this college. Uh, we have been interacting for a long time over mail. It was great having you this webinar. Thank you very much, Dr. Franco. Thanks to you, Dr. Pani. It's a pleasure to meet you finally, and um, it's a uh, pleasure yeah. to have been here and talk to your to your colleagues. It was a wonderful uh, presentation, Dr. Franco. Thank you. So uh, I hand over this mic to Onuradha for formal thanks to Dr. Franco. Uh, yes, of course. Uh, but I think uh, I would hand over the mic further to Dr. Shuparna Ganguly, uh, my esteemed colleague, because she is supposed to uh, uh, be delivering the vote of thanks and also thank Dr. Franco in person. So Shuparna, could you kindly uh, do the need? need? Yes. Uh, sure. Thank you, Anuradha. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Franco, for this excellent presentation. And uh, before we move on to the vote of thanks, it's uh, we are left with the interactive session. So we have collected the questions from our audience for both our speakers. And Professor Piali Set will conduct the session. Uh, so I hand over the mic to Professor Piali Set uh, for conducting the question answer session. Over to you, Piali. Yes, good evening again. And thank you again, our distinguished speakers, for their wonderful presentation. It was indeed very informative and erudite. Uh, to begin with the questions, uh, I would like to go according to the sequence of the technical sessions. So uh, let me uh, begin with Dr. Professor Shujay Ghosh. Now, the First question, uh, I think uh, if Professor Goes agrees, I would uh, put one question at a time. That would make it uh, simpler. So the first question uh, is, uh, is put forward by Dr. Abdul Hadi from uh, Bongobashi College. He's an assistant professor of economics. He, likes, uh, he would want to know that is there any difference between the rate of infection uh, regarding a child and an adult? To Dr. Ho. Hello. Yes. Hello. Yeah, please repeat the question. Yes, yes, uh, yes, Dr. Ghosh. Uh, this question comes from Dr. Abdul Hadi. Uh, he's from Bongobashi College. He wants to know uh, is there any difference between, the, uh, between a child and an adult regarding the rate of infection? Yeah, definitely. Actually, adults are more susceptible to the infections than a child do. The, the main cause of this difference is that receptor that I have shown in my lecture that the receptor is actually prevalent uh, in the respiratory tract mucosa, particularly among the adult. For children, these receptors are ill-developed and that's the cause, the big difference between the susceptibility. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, there is another question. This is regarding plasma therapy. Uh, this comes from Shumita Sengupta. Uh, she wants to know that is plasma therapy possible given uh, uh, given uh, West Bengal's uh, social and economic status, uh, particularly uh, in the context of rural Bengal? Is plasma therapy possible here? Yeah, it's not impossible uh, in the context of socioeconomic condition. It is actually depends upon the 
consent of the donor as more and more donor will be available donor means particularly those who have recovered from the infection if the donors are available willing donors who will donate their plasma uh, for the further research and for the therapeutic use then it's possible otherwise uh, if donor is not there how could you proceed for the plasma therapy okay uh the next two questions are in fact of the same kind uh, i i have just kind of uh, put them together uh, but they, these two come from two different people vishwanath mukherji and sumita sen gupta again uh, they want to know that regarding indian government's claim uh, of vaccination being available by the 15th of august uh, how would you like to comment on this uh, is it believable or is it possible well uh, it is a very controversial issues uh, and it remain controversial so over the last couple of weeks in the media also it's not possible to say at which date or which time uh, the um, vaccination or vaccine will come into the market because as i have shown in the uh, my lecture that vaccination needs so many different stages to pass and ultimately different uh, trials and the compliance of the different authorities it's a time taking lengthy process so in no way we are in not positions that we could say that yes that is the date and that will be the date or that will be the time when we will have the vaccine we can tentatively calculate that month or that year that uh, by this time vaccination vaccine may be uh, available in the market but it's very difficult to say at which time perfectly the vaccine will be in hand so it's not possible so uh, sir there is a secondary question related to this issue of vaccination uh this uh, this question particularly focuses on the role of human trial uh, especially in the indian context uh, any comment on that sir yeah human trial is the final stage for any vaccine to be launched so human trial again depends upon the participation of the willing volunteers so if the willing volunteers and the success of any other factors are related factors are there then vaccination and the uh, possibility of having a vaccine in hand will be increased but if there is not sufficient trial at the human level and the results will not come properly then vaccination will delay okay sir and sir uh, uh, coming uh, lastly clearly, uh, la clearly. Last, yes Uh, yes. yes uh, sorry to interrupt you but uh, dr franco would need to leave by 15 minutes maximum so okay. he was asking if we could uh, take his questions and then carry on with dr ghosh's uh, questions because there there seem to be many in number so okay. could you uh, dr ghosh sorry for the sure. inconvenience but uh, would you mind if okay, we okay okay it's all right you all right okay. thank you so much thanks a lot for your cooperation sir okay uh thank you uh, dr ghosh and uh, dr franco thank you again for the for your presentation uh the first two are in fact uh, has uh, is a request for your comment on uh, particularly this comes from uh, ms uh, sumana bhattacharya she is our uh, college she a librarian uh, she uh, wants to know uh, your comment on whose investigation on the origin of the virus and also uh, whose steps that it wants to take as well as the international efforts on uh, on the point that china uh, the china is the origin of origin of the virus and uh, regarding the fact that china needs to be made accountable for this yeah i think at this point of time what matters the most is to understand uh, where the virus came from how long has the virus been circulating how did it happen that it went from one species to another species and at this point i don't think it's time to point fingers it is indeed the case that there will be an independent investigation it has been launched the who is involved many countries are involved but it is clear that the virus has been circulating um it probably not have been just circulating in china and therefore this should be an international investigation um rather than pointing fingers at this point you could but i think that matters the most is to try to find a solution for the pandemic and try to find an understanding on how this 
this situation happen. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, the next question comes from Koshik Ganguly. Uh, he wants to know: Is there any correlation between uh, mortality due to COVID-19 as well as the blood group antigen? Particularly, uh, he specifically wants to know if AB blood group, uh, which uh, according to him, his information is said to be more vulnerable. So is there any RCT study to confirm this hypothesis? There is no RCT study yet, but there has been reports from observational studies and from genetic studies. And basically what they found is that people with type A seems to seem to have a higher uh, level of uh, complications or severity compared to people that have type O. Um, this, however, the effects are very uh, small. They are not that very large. And if you, if you put this into context, uh, we see that other factors such as age, presence of comorbidities, socioeconomic status, gender, play a far more important role that type of blood. I think what is important is that it allows us to understand potential mechanisms of how the virus might affect human beings. And it also allows us to understand mechanisms that might lead to therapeutic uh, conditions. But by no means, it means that if you are type A, you are condemned and you are doomed to have uh, severe COVID-19 and you're going to die. You just have a higher risk, but the levels of difference are very low. OK. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, sir, towards the latter part of your presentation, uh, you were talking about uh, reopening of the economy, uh, economies all around the world. So would you like to comment on the fact that reopening of the economy uh, has led to the rate of infections around, around the globe? Yes, reopening is, uh, is a necessary uh, it's a necessary aspect for every society in, in the world because we cannot have a disease uh, limiting and curtailing all our activities. We need to be able to work, but at the same time, we need to be able to maintain the virus away. What has been happening is that some places have reopened too fast yeah. and they have reopened while the virus is still circulating. And one of the first conditions to be able to um, be able to reopen is to uh, have a control on the transmission of the virus. If the transmission is no control and you reopen too fast, the virus is going to go completely out of control and the explosion is going to be exponential. So it is very important that vigilance, test and isolate is maintained very strictly and an observation, very strict observation of the transmission of the virus is maintained and that the reopening of the economy is done step by step. It is necessary, it is important, but it has to be done carefully. Yes, uh, so in other words, uh, the efforts to contain the virus needs to be more concerted and more streamlined uh, when reopening of ec economy takes place. Okay, uh, so thank you, sir. I'm sure our listeners uh, have been absolutely satisfactory with your answers. Uh, thank you, sir, again. Thank you very much to you. And thank you, Dr. Goch, for uh, leaving me to answer the questions first. Yes, uh, over to Shuponadi. Uh, thank you, Pierre Lee. Uh, I'm sure that all of us got ourselves enriched with the valuable insights provided by our eminent panelists. Now, without wasting much time, I uh, would go into the formal vote of thanks to all our dignitaries present in the webinar. Uh, I would like to extend my sincere thanks to the Honorable President and other members of the governing body, the internal and external members of the IQAC of our college for extending their support to make this event successful. I convey special thanks to our principal, Dr. Rathna Pani, who always encourages us to go beyond our academic field and venture into multidisciplinary activities. Uh, he also deserves special thanks for his very well-documented and uh, informative welcome speech. Thank you, sir. I convey my sincere thanks to our uh, vice principal, Professor Prithish Kumar Roy, our bursar, Professor Joyanta Mukherjee, our IQAC coordinator, Dr. Shonali Roy, for encouraging us and giving us all the support to organize this webinar. I thank Dr. Shuja Ghosh and Dr. Oscar Franco, our distinguished speakers, for taking out time from their busy schedule 
to be with us and illuminating us with their highly informative and engaging talk. I would also like to thank the participants whose enthusiastic presence has made the event a grand success. I would like to thank Professor Piali Seth for conducting the interactive sessions, Dr. Rongshuman Mukhopadhyay, the convener, and Professor Onuradha Mujumdar, the joint convener, Sri Nimai Pradhan, our head clerk, Mr. Shonjip Karwal, our accountant, for taking all the trouble to make this event successful. Finally, I thank all my colleagues, teaching and non-teaching, and our dear students for extending wholehearted support. And last but not the least, I sincerely thank Dr. Salam and StreamYard for providing us with the entire technical support to make this event a success. While we sign off for the day, we do acknowledge the fact that such a short session was not enough to answer all your queries we hope to arrange many such thought-provoking sessions in near future while sailing through the new normal. Till then, wish you all a very safe and healthy time ahead. Thank you.